supporting the festival. And welcome again to our guest, Ella Zaharen. Um, I'll speak English, obviously, and if there is any issues, I'll translate. We can talk Turkish if you feel comfortable, as much as, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, okay? And we'll translate if we need to. Um, so, we heard your life stories from Dr. Kulak, so they know about that. This is billed as the film, the first film, made in Turkey during the centennial of the genocide, about 1915. That's what all the advertisements say. So my first question, and either one of you can answer, is whose idea was it? Who thought of it? And how did you tune it? Portfolios just overflowing with research and 
pictures and postcards and I did. And he just, he was so touched by all this thing we were doing. He said, I love your energy, I love what you're trying to do, I'll work with you. And afterwards, he went back to Berlin, I sent him the screenplay and he called me one night and he said, Ella, I started crying after I read it. I, I'm going home now. He was at his uh, office. He said, I'm going home. I'm going to hug my sons and I'm going to work with you. So then it was uh, a good start for us. Yeah, and before Wahed, uh, we just met with Yetwar Tomasian, you know, I think uh, the head of Arasa Egypt. Right. Uh, and uh, Yetwar. Publishing House Aras. Yes, yes. Uh, publishing House Aras. And he knows very well the Anatolia and the culture. And we just, after writing our script, go to his office and two of us, three of us, we start to read and read and read. And at one point, you know, he stops up and this one could be like that and, uh, you know, this uh, Yeah, Yetvar Tomasian was so good at this. He would, uh, for example, we have the scene uh, the day before Zadik and he told us the mother would be wearing an apron with the, uh, with the, with the frills. With the laces, uh, uh, just that day she would be wearing the special apron. So all these little details he knew about, which all came together in our film. So, at what point did you have to decide, okay, where do we shoot this? Choose a location. Right. How did that happen? Uh, first of all, Eras father is living in Cappadocia, and uh, we just took many locations before we started uh, where we need to shoot that. But what we wanted is to shoot that film in Anatolia because uh, 100 years ago, these things took place in Anatolia and we need to shoot at the place right place, with the right people. That's why we choose uh, Armenians living in Istanbul. And... Uh, I was going to ask you, casting, casting and how did you do that? Right. Uh, what location? Yeah. Location? Yes. So, uh, we went to Cappadocia and Last, I think, 70 days, and every day from 8 o'clock we start to drive and we go to several locations to Kayseri, Gangir. We already gone to uh, you know, India, Kazan's America, America. We go to America, America, every place, you know, every location, and we find out that every church is decapitated. You know, there, there's no more church, there's no more marketplace, and everywhere is mess. So uh, we decided to make uh, there are real locations on the team, also we build some locations, like the marketplace, because there is no marketplace anymore, you know? wow. and there is not a church that you can use. There is only uh, a church that we found, the Greek church, but we turned out to an Armenian church, and uh, everybody worked so hard to make the order and the things. By the way, can people hear? Yeah. No. No, but I think you need to. I think. It's either not working or it's not working. So, I'm dying. Tell them how we made the church. Exactly. Yes. That's what I think. So, tell them about the church. So the church was empty, you know, what we found is only a Greek church uh, which can be used for film. So uh, we go to the British church in Istanbul who renovates church even in Venice and all over the world. And he gave us all the equipment needed 100 years ago, uh, candles, candlesticks, things. And Tatul Anushan from Istanbul who helped us to find out uh, 100 years ago priest costumes. So yes, so we, we made the church. Everything we did in the film, we did it from photographs. So uh, the marketplace, their house, the church, everything uh, was made exactly from the photographs. Also the costumes. No, 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 it's okay, I can hold it close. Of 
course. So I got two questions, but I want to go to the, they're both in my mind before I forget, and then I'm going to go to the audience so we can all participate. Um, one is, I think, what comes to us as an obvious question. Uh, you've left Istanbul, you're in central Turkey. Um, you're shooting a movie about Armenians, something that happened 100 years ago, um, in an environment where they probably don't see Armenians that often. Right? So, did they know? Do, do the people living in the area know that uh, you're sh what the subject of the movie is? No, we told them we were making a love story. <laughs> because when you say that, they don't ask any more questions. And then they would say, but there's two children. So we would say, oh, it's a flashback of when they met. <laughs> so, how about the... Uh, or bodies. Did they know what you were doing? Okay, uh, first of all... Um, the government. Okay, uh, we yeah, we have to tell you the background. Uh, in, uh, in 2012, uh, Aaron and I applied to the uh, Ministry of Culture Cinema Fund because uh, it was impossible to shoot this film without their approval because of the subject matter. And uh, they loved the story, but they did not want to pass it because no film had been made about the subject. So uh, they made us wait one year and uh, miraculously... We, we just said to them, we don't want your money. We want your approval because we need to do this film in Anatolia with real people. Uh, that's all we want. So, so miraculously they passed, the, uh, the, uh, uh, they passed our film. So we had the paperwork saying uh, Ministry of Culture Cinema Fund approved project, Yiti uh, Kushlar. But of course, when you go to the Kaimakam or Wali, they don't know what it's about. Uh, but something, uh, I'll tell you the story. Uh, uh, this one guy uh, in uh, this village in Kayseri. This village called Kayaba. Uh, we, we had told him the story, so he goes to the coffee shop, to the cafe, and he tells all the men there, oh, don't worry, these are good kids, the story is very good, and he tells them the story, so these guys came... All, all, all the refugees uh, as came to our set, you know, <laughs> they are like, <laughs> all, all, all around the set, and, uh, but the thing is, we are uh, 80 people on the set, they are only the three people, so... <laughs> so, but they kept coming back and coming back, so at the end my father, he took a chair and he just sat in front of the set and um, he said to them, what are you doing? This film was uh, government approved and the guy goes, even governments make mistakes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Uh, and, uh, yeah, casting, budgeting, you know, what kind of problems did you deal with and how did you overcome them? Uh, the casting of the film is really a case study uh, because as you see there are two children uh, on the main actors and uh, we just uh, make a cast out of five, 560, 20, 520, 20 child child has just came to our office with their mothers and our office is very small and it means I think uh, one child comes with 500 people <laughs> on the office one office. child comes with the mother, the grandmother, the father, the auntie <laughs> <laughs> so it was very hard to select Bedo and Maria because it was the heart of the film and we go over and over and over and we just started with all the uh, advertising agencies casting agencies. We finished them all in Turkey and we started to go to Jujuyet, Biliet, like we made a shape at. We, we just uh, made advertising that we are searching for kids and they came, 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 came and uh, we just found Marian first. And uh, Bedo, Bedo is another story. <laughs> Bedo is another story. So we found Marian but we couldn't find Bedo and we were 
feeling very hopeless. And then we kept going to the uh, Armenian uh, elementary schools. And uh, at the end, we went to Eros' school. And um, we told the prime, um, we told the, the principal, uh, you know, can you tell the parents we're making such a film? And so, of course, the parents were scared. So, like, a couple of kids came, and one of them was Eros. And he. And the first time, Eros has problems. Uh, Harold was having some speech problems speech when problem, he first yeah. came. He has it, but he has a perfect child. He just uh, sensed it, but uh, it was impossible to uh, make the film with Harold because the problem is very severe and Beto cannot be, have the speech problem and he has also facial reactions like that. But he has a psychological problem first. So we talked with his mother and we said we will search another role, maybe on the orphanage. Uh, and we passed him. But after six months, I think, I just said to Ella that I have an idea, we need to make a cast again for Heros. And uh, we called her mother and she said that all the things has passed away, you know, the uh, speech problem and things. And we make another cast for Heros. And, and there was another boy, so there was Heros left and one other boy. And Heros came in and he was so amazing that got the part and he, he's when we first met him he told us I'm the happiest boy in the whole world so uh, the first day of our shoot uh, it was uh, in Kayseri minus 20 degrees uh, in winter time and everybody's freezing and he came to me and he said to me this is the happiest moment of my life <laughs> I think uh... Let's participate. Go ahead. Uh, I have one question I would like for them to say something about the music in the movie, which everybody is going to appreciate. Uh, <laughs> okay, how we find the music of those verses in another case study. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, we choose one thing. The music of uh, those verses must be going as part of it. We, we just make this clear. So, after we made this decision, we just, uh, with Ella, listened nearly all the musics uh, of Govindas Vartabet and uh, all the musicians, new and old ones, who made the music of Govindas. And we found those musics and we made the edit and it was perfect at the, you know, at the finish of the edit. But later on, the question is how we can find now these musicians to have the rights for these musics. So we made this list and it was looking impossible because first of all it was going to be very expensive and second of all how are we going to get them to approve it and uh, we started with John Gezician, uh, he lives in California and they told us that he wasn't well but thank God he was and we called him and we told him the story and then he watched the film and uh, he signed all the papers, he says, I don't want any money, just use my song. And um, the next week he died, so... Uh, well, it was very dramatic because uh, before he signed, we also started to talk after he was, because we sent the film to Orange County, to the place that he lived. And uh, he watched the film and he just started to mail that I have also a story like that. And he told me his story and we just said, each other that we will come to California to finish the post-production the time that we went to Syria. We, we just, you know, uh, say all these words and he just give uh, her, his, his music to us and we cannot see him before he died, you know. It was the time. So, uh, so and anyway, we need to call Helen also. So, uh, so after John Bilezikcian, uh, we got in touch with Ayla Sarkisian, who did the song Anthony and he lives in um, Boston and he just signed, he didn't want anything he said, and, and then we found um, Shahan Arzuni who owned the rights to the, um, the, the <laughs> another song of his, uh, of his um, relative and all these musicians they just you know they just gave the rights to the, their songs to us which was a miracle for us and um, it's 
Zerbo Gormia of the film is... Garbiza Pikian. His son lives in Paris and he also... Garbiza Pikian is the writer. The writer is Govina, the composer of the song. And this Zerbo Gormia is very special. If you come to the film, you will see and hear. It's only one, there is only one existing, this kind of voice and composition. There is, because I uh, listen to all the Derbo Gormia in church or out of church made for the film. Only this one, and it was very hard to find. Uh, Sonia Nigosia is the vocal. Uh, and to find his son, because God, Sabrina is not living anymore. Uh, but his son uh, is living, so he is living in Paris, and we just find his son and we ask permission. And all of the music, you know, is just came by miracle. Wow, that's amazing people. <laughs> you are amazing, so. Uh, any other questions? Uh, how does uh, Article 301 going to be applied to this movie? Article 301 meaning uh, hurling Turkish prestige, uh, uh, insulting Turkish. Turkish. Yeah. How is that going to be a problem? Do you think, do you think there are scenes in this movie that the Turkish government might say, wow, this is going to hurt the Turkish uh, island? No, because our film, when you come and watch it, you will see doesn't insult anybody. It's a film about love and family, and uh, so I don't think anybody will have a problem with it. I don't know. <laughs> and just for me to give you the background, what we know about 301 and the way it was implemented, it allowed anybody, any lawyer, could go and file a case. That's when Hrant was alive. That's why it wasn't filed by government was filed by private lawyers who were right-wing attorneys. Since his death, they changed the law. Now, only government can bring that action, Justice Department. And you can't file private criminal cases. So, the bottom line is, if they got the authorization, they got the government to approve it, it's very doubtful that the government would file, even if they perceived it, unlike what Ella told you that it is, in her opinion, not insulting anyways. But even if somebody thought it was, it's not going to happen, most likely. Anybody else? Is it subtitled? Yes, it's English no. subtitled. Yes. Physical uh, 
and you know shapes and things be reversed again and again and again to have this ambiance of Armenian family. And because in this case, lost birth case, uh, one there is two actors, but all of the chemistry must be perfect. You know, they must be good brother and sister. They must be a very perfect Armenian family, and all of this match must need to be matched. That's all. That's all. You need to be, because when you are working with children, you need to be there in their world. So, no acting coach, nothing more. And I and I, we just uh, work with them on the set and before and after. And there, there were some scenes that we are talking in their language and every crew members, you know, look that we are crazy because we are uh, acting nonsense. We are. Uh, using a different language that uh, <laughs> we can start with them, and <laughs> because they want to, they, we want them to love, and we are saying you know stupid things, and <laughs> all the crew, you know, <laughs> you are crazy. <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, maybe I'll ask a question, and somebody can think of. Um, so it's seven years in Pakistan, right? The, the first part of today? Yes. Okay. He, both of you should answer this question. How have you changed, if at all, having put this film together? In other words, if I spoke to you seven years ago and I said, April 24, 1915, Armenians, Anatolia, what would you think? And today, seven years from now, how would you answer that same question? Different, same? Uh, before I, I read any of the research, I didn't know anything, just you know, small things that you would hear. So I learned a lot and we just got so much into it that you know we recognized photographs and just when we look at photographs and things like that, we can recognize regions and costumes. And uh, so historically, we learned a lot. But also, uh, through Lost Birth, we have met so many wonderful people. People who have told us their stories that they kept for a long, long time. And I think it, it just connected us more with people around us. And also, even our cast in Istanbul, they're just so amazing, and we wouldn't have met them if we wouldn't make this film. And I have a different point of view to that question. When we uh, were at location scouting, we went to one place uh, called Tavlusum. It's near Gernir in Kayseri. And uh, we just walk, it's city is already, you know, ruined. Uh, and in those rings we started to walk and suddenly I start to cry, I don't know why. And I just looked to her and she cried also. And we just sense something in there, you know, like children are still playing, like some souls in it, you know. That, that there is something going on with that street, I don't know. And that day it changed, something changed in my mind. And I think two or three times I just called to her, I finished this project, I don't want it anymore. I just said it. Because I learned too many things that, you know, bothered me and I have nightmares, you know. So Aryan was having all these nightmares and, and, I mean, some of the stuff he was reading, he didn't show me because I said, I cannot read this, I cannot look at this. So it was very hard for us, some of the things. But we had to focus on the good things to make this film. This is, okay, the reason why we did a lot of the things in this film is that when we did all this research and we called all these costume people, they had no idea about the material or the costumes. For example, all the costumes of our family, we did it from the Dildilian family album. Uh, so uh, the costume designers who were coming in had no clue about you know, Armenian village life or any of these things. 
So at the end we said, okay, I said to Aaron, I'm going to do it. So we separated all the characters and then we went to buy all the material and uh, 12 different Armenian tailors worked on this film. And basically we did every costume one by one. Even the villagers passing by, we made them. So, yeah. We just, you know, uh, organized it very well, I think, because after the research, uh, as we mentioned, we worked with Wahe in Berlin, we just make a whole list of the costumes with the characters, and we just sent to Berlin uh, for Wahe to check it, and Wahe just changed what is wrong, and we go with that picture to the tailor, and uh, not first to the uh, shape, much, much the fabric. fabric. Yeah, we go we have to buy the fabric, and we show the photographs to the man, you know, the man is also Armin and he knows it. Uh, so we choose the fabrics and go to the tailor. But tailors are, like you said, it was 12 tailor because children costume is a different thing. Uh, a good costume of women in church is a different thing. And uh, just 12 of Armenian tailors uh, were on that way. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, there's shoes and different, you know, type of stuff that in addition to the costumes and fabric. Go ahead. Did you create the story? I mean, is this based on a real life story? Or is it made it up? Fiction. As I said, it's very complicated to answer that because we just written with Ella, but after analyzing these things and, you know, uh, reading and talking with real people, uh, all the stories in 1915, in some point, get together, you know? It's all mixed up, and if you go deep enough, you just write something which is very close to real. So... I think it's what we call reality-based fiction. That's what it is. Um, okay. okay, there's people raising. You want to talk? talk. Hmm?
you also walk the walk. And for that, we thank you, we applaud you, we wish you the best, and thank you for being here.